Hi, I'm Matt Dobbs. I'm a professor at McGill University. I study cosmology and I also build telescopes. And today I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey about uh, to show you something of the new telescopes we're designing and putting on the sky today. So the last two speakers are people who primarily calculate how things will look on the night sky. They calculate how the cosmic microwave background will look, how it's bent and deflected by light. And nobody would listen to them if their calculations and predictions hadn't been borne out with real instruments and technology that look up at the cosmos above us and prove them right. Actually, they only have to be right some of the time before they get famous. <laughs> but it's that technology, those telescopes, that are the other important uh, ingredient to understanding the cosmos. Now, most of the images you're used to seeing of the night sky, of, of the universe above us, are images that are typically full of structure, complexity, and beauty. Zooming in on a narrow part of the sky to see things like planets beyond our own solar system, to zoom in on the details of what's inside distant galaxies, or to find out that a great amount of what we're seeing on the night side is controlled by black holes, something that we'll hear about later. In today's talk, I'm going to tell you about technology and telescopes that zooms out and allows us to image the whole sky, to bring back that big picture that ultimately lets us understand how the universe as a whole is born, evolves, what it's made of, the dark matter, the stuff that's in there that isn't all just us, and ultimately how it's going to evolve to its future fate. These are the types of telescopes that I've been focusing on building, and I'm going to show you a new revolution in the way that we're starting to look at the sky, a new type of telescope that we're looking at the sky with. Now, I showed these little cartoon sketches of objects. And typically, the images you're used to seeing are objects that are revealed in the same wavelength that your eye looks at the sky with, in the optical band. Let's move out to larger scales and look at wavelengths that are about a millimeter. This is where the cosmic microwave background is. And let's join that journey of revealing the night sky, go back to the 90s when COBE was launched, and look up. Look up everywhere in the night sky with a telescope that has scanned it all. What do we see? Well, we see a universe. This is real data. This is from that COBE satellite. And it cost NASA, the United States government, about a half a billion dollars to bring this information down. What we see is a universe that on these very, very large scales is the same in every direction we look in and appears to be in the same in every location. The laws of physics that govern our universe appears to be the same everywhere. Now this image, which comes from a very early time in the evolution of the universe, if the universe was the age, lived to the age of a person so that today we're about 100 years old, this would be the first day of the life of the universe. This telescope brings back that image. Now, this is what the sky looks like. Let's, let's just take a moment and feel the human journey of it. Imagine if you built this telescope, if you spent years putting, putting this telescope together, and you looked up in the night sky and you saw this. This is a very accurate image. The early first image uh, was less accurate, but it showed the same thing. What do you think? You've now discovered an intimate part of the physics of how the universe is. I'd probably pick up the phone and I'd call my mother maybe and say, the telescope's broken. No matter where we look, we see the same thing. It's, it's not turning on properly. We've got to go by. And that actually was the thought pattern when people looked up and first saw this. Saw that the early universe is a place that is simple, that is symmetric, that is beautiful in this very, very special way. And so piecing that together, this early signal from the universe to today where we have this complexity and structure and beauty is part of that great vision and view of cosmology, to understand the equations that govern that evolution. And that's what we're trying to do with uh, the world of cosmology. And we've put together quite an amazing picture with a, which agrees with all of the observations we have out there. We have an expanding universe that Dick and Gil described to us that appears to be governed, driven by what's inside it. The matter, the ordinary stuff, baryons, people, planets, stars, galaxies, the dark matter that we don't quite understand very well, even though they fit the equations that are put together, and dark energy. The telescope I'm going to tell you about today tries to fill in the gaps between 
the present universe that's full of all this structure and the early universe that is so, so simple. It's trying to image the universe when it was about one half to one fifth its present age, when, this, when the universe is taken over by its normal expansion and driven out faster and faster through, through dark energy. Okay, before I can tell you about this telescope, I have to just remind you what I think everyone in this room already knows. Telescopes are exploration vehicles. It's like the ships that brought us from the old world to the new world. Telescopes allow us to look out at a given point on the night sky and explore what's there. But they're way more exciting than that because they are also time machines. And you know this. Here in the front row, I'm looking at uh, our future speakers, and they're 10 feet away, and light travels at about one foot every billionth of a second. So snap, when I take a photo of these people, I don't see them as they are now. I see them as they were 10 billionths of a second ago. So I won't know if they're making fun of me for a little moment. And at the back of the room, I see you, you're 100 feet away. I see you as you were 10 billionths of a second ago. And when I look out at the sun, the sun's light takes eight minutes to reach me, so I see it as it was eight minutes ago. Big deal. When I look out in the cosmos with a very, very powerful telescope and I look far, far away, I get to see the universe as it was a million years ago, a billion years ago, and so forth. And since when I draw my picture of the evolution backwards in time, we get to a more compact universe where all of us, everything, eventually gets to the same location, I am seeing the universe as a whole as it was a long, long time ago. So by taking these images at different distances, I am learning about the evolution, the growth of our own universe, and that's key. Now, we're used to looking at the sky in the optical band. We're used to looking with our own eyes in the optical band. The telescope I'm going to describe today is looking out, not in the microwave, where the images that have been shown so far are, which is about a millimeter to a centimeter or so, but way out in the radio band. The same band where your cell phones and your computers communicate. That's a nice band to be in because uh, the wavelengths are long and the frequencies, the repetition rate of the oscillation of light is uh, long enough that we can record it with traditional devices. Let's take a journey not to the South Pole, where uh, the previous telescope that Gil showed is, but instead out to Western Canada to the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory, a government lab, a government zone, where we've protected the environment from radio frequency interference, and we're building a new telescope called the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. The construction of this telescope is a collaboration of, of uh, three universities and the National Research Council of the, the University of British Columbia, University of Toronto, and, at, and McGill University. This is what the site looks like. It's shielded from nearby towns by small mountains. And everyone can see the obvious telescope in this image. It must be over there in the, in, in the medium right-hand side. There's a big radio dish. That's not the telescope I'm talking about. The telescope we're putting together right now, CHIME, are these half-pipe skateboard-like ramps that are shown on the left-hand side of the screen here. It is a highly non-traditional telescope because it does not look at a point in the sky by taking a big dish, rotating it to where it wants to look, and focusing all the light down on a small camera. Instead, it lays on its back, and there are no moving parts whatsoever, and it collects all the electromagnetic light that falls from overhead and uses a giant computer to deconvolve that information and understand the sky that must have produced it from above. I'll show you a little bit more about it. So here's CHIME. It consists of these four cylinders. They're about 20 meters wide and 100 meters long. So all in all, it's the scale of about six NHL scale hockey rinks, to give us all something we're, we're familiar with. Peppered along the center of each one of these cylinders are these feed lines. And there's a thousand different radio receivers that lie along these feed lines. So that's the feed line that you see here. And each one of these is just an antenna, and it collects all the radio information that has, has, has fallen on, on the cylinders. Sitting behind it is a giant computer. And it takes the information from each one of these antennas and processes it in a way that it can figure out whether the combined light that it's receiving is coming from this location or that location or somewhere else on the night sky. The amount of information that's flowing through this telescope is on the same scale, it's comparable, to the total amount of information that the world's mobile data network is transferring right now. 
It's a whole lot of information. That's one of the reasons we're choosing to build this new paradigm of telescope that receives all the light and calculates what's going on. This new paradigm of telescope at these radio wavelengths. Because at those longer wavelengths, we can now afford to buy and build the computers that do this processing. A photograph of time with the obligatory night sky. It doesn't need to be dark for this telescope to operate, of course. Now, with a traditional telescope, you choose your objects. You have large committees of people that figure out where they'd like to be pointed, and you point at this galaxy or this star or this quasar or whatnot. With a telescope like Chime, the beauty of it is that you get to puzzle in the pieces between everything else. Every night with a telescope like Chime, we see the entire overhead sky. And that's really important for a field like cosmology, where we're studying the entire evolution of the universe. And it's also going to be really important for fields like transient science, where we're looking for things that are going pop and boom on the night sky, and we need to monitor everything that's overhead. And you'll hear a lot about that this afternoon as well. And that's one of the other big fortes of a telescope like CHIME. So let's take a moment to see how it works. I've drawn a, a one cylinder here, and I've put just one antenna in that cylinder. And it looks up at the night sky, and the red and the blue colors here are the part of the sky that that antenna sees. And uh, the, the image is a radio image of the night sky. And the part that's highlighted here, the circle, is the horizon. That's what you can see from horizon to horizon um, at one, one point in the day. Now, this isn't a very useful telescope, because if something goes pop and boom over here or here or here, I won't be able to tell the difference. It'll look like just one signal. But when I move forward and I take this cylinder and I put a lot of antennas down it and I run the information into a computer, I can then separate out that big slosh across the sky and divide it up into separate little places that I look in the night sky. And I can start to say what, where something happened or where the light is coming from. And as I build more of these cylinders, so in this case I now have four cylinders and I have many antennas down the cylinders, I can take all that information that's coming into my telescope and deconvolve it so that I'm looking in all of these different directions simultaneously. This is great. Astronomers don't have to argue with each other about where to look. We're going to look everywhere in this big beam. We're missing one key component, though, because the telescope doesn't move. And there's a whole lot of sky over here that I'm not looking at right now. Fortunately, though the telescope doesn't move, planet Earth spins around once every day. And so, in the course of a day, I get to map out the entire overhead sky spun around the North Celestial Pole. This telescope is at a latitude of about 45 degrees, so the sky is spinning around this point. And now, with this new novel type of technology, where I'm moving the complexity of my telescope from the camera into this back-end computer that does the processing, and I don't have moving parts. Every night I get to see the whole overhead sky and do my cosmology, do my transient science with it. So there's CHIME, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, which we're putting together right now. We've built all parts of the telescope, and it's being assembled for its first light at the end of the summer or early fall, looking up at the night sky, able to see overhead, able to see off to the north, and so forth. There are, of course, some things we can't see, things that are shielded by planet Earth itself. Now, one other thing I want to emphasize here, I've shown you some technology and cartoons of technology, but the real thing that's novel and innovative in here are the people that are putting this together. And that's where our real resource is and where the real challenges are. The technology that, went, that is going into building the CHIME telescope or the technology that went into building the South Pole telescope did not exist when those telescopes were conceived. We needed bright people to get together in the, the lab and develop the technology to, to make those telescopes happen. So people tell, uh, people build these telescopes. So with telescopes like CHIME, we're moving into a new world where we're able to image not just points on the night sky, but the entire overhead sky and monitor and record what's going on there. And so I hope the next time I'm giving a lecture like this, I'm able to show you exactly what's going on in this period of the universe from about half its present age to a fifth of its present age so that we can string together the very early universe with the very late universe and understand its evolution. Thank you.